As you can see there, Dr. Archana Sharma, she is the Indian staff scientist at CERN, and she was involved in path-making discovery of Hawkes boson particle in 2012. Well, she moved from Jhansi to CERN, and the mecca of particle physics has been remarkable and a story of inspiration for many Indian scientists. She is internationally recognized, and she has been part of several experiments with a degree in physics from BHU Varanasi, her PhD from Delhi University, and a DSC from the University of Geneva. She has donned several hats as a physicist, teacher, and also a project manager at CERN. It's an honor having you, madam. May I request you to please come onto the dais and share with us your experiences in the scientific space. Thank you. Everybody can hear me? Thank you very much for this very warm welcome. And also many thanks to the organizers for reaching out to me for this very special conference, which is pretty different from anything that I've ever been before. You know, we go to scientists' conferences, but here it's really been a change of perspective for me because I come from CERN where being a project manager is a very secondary thing. However, it's becoming very, very, very important simply because the scale of projects have gone completely global and they have gone completely international. Number of people, number of institutions is unbelievably um, big and therefore project management is something that just happens organically in the world of science from where I come. So once again, thank you very much for having me here. Now, what exactly do we do at CERN? At CERN, this is, of course, particle physics. Now, it's a strange subject which not many of you may have heard about. You may have heard about physics, but you may not have heard about particle physics, right? But you did hear about the Big Bang, right? How many? Everybody, yes. And did you hear about the, uh, the fact that in 2008, the world was coming to an end? Some, people, some of you heard about that, right? The world was going to come to an end because a little laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland was going to switch on a rather big machine called the Large Hadron Collider, right? And that the world would come to an end. But it didn't happen, and we'll get to that point. At CERN, we are at the leading edge of engineering and technological partnerships with industry and, of course, knowledge transfer. So we work somehow in recreating the Big Bang. Obviously, not to the point where the world, world would come to an end, but tiny, tiny, micro, nano, pico, Big Bangs that happen in the accelerator, and we try to study what exactly uh, is matter made of and what, uh, what, was the time, what was the universe at the time of the Big Bang. And clearly we work at the edge of, uh, oops, uh, is there a pointer here? Anyway, so of course uh, people are very, very skilled and they are not only skilled, but you have to gather the skills as you go along because many of the things that we would like to work with do not exist. So we have to work together with industry on the R&Ds and create new materials or new algorithms or new designs for mechanical engineering and so on. So it's such a challenge working always at the edge of technology and at the edge of knowledge as such. It's a very big uh, worldwide network and clearly network management is a very uh, big challenge as well. So let's take a quick look at what CERN is.
That's my experiment where I work. So here you saw a small film which essentially represents 30 years of work that goes on at CERN. Starting from the design of the collider itself, the design of the experiments where we look at what's happening within the collisions that happen in the collider, at the data that comes out and the signal, you saw this little blip on a chart which actually eventually led to the Nobel Prize. So that's what we do at CERN, where our main scientific challenge is to look at the mysteries of the universe. So you might wonder, what kind of mysteries are we looking at? Do you believe that we are all made of matter? So are the stars, and the table, and the chairs, and the, and the uh, greenery around us, right? But at the time of the Big Bang, if matter and antimatter which should have been produced in equal amounts, what should have happened? They should have annihilated each other, isn't it? So, why are we here at all? It means that matter and antimatter are different. Or, more matter was produced than antimatter. What is this asymmetry of nature? So there are several of these kind of questions that we are trying to look at the, from the Big Bang 14 billion years after where we are over here. This is the typical bell curve that shows you that 14 billion years after the Big Bang, we are here living in the universe, thinking about the universe, whether it is a universe or multiverses, whether there are other forms of matter and other forms of dimensions. Where should I point? Yeah. So exactly what we do is that we push back the frontiers of knowledge at CERN. We develop new technologies for accelerators and detectors and information technology. We train the scientists and engineers of tomorrow. Once a physicist, always a physicist. And a physicist can do everything. Remember that. And of course, in doing such very large projects, we unite people from different cultures and different countries. So here what you see is really the, the, the Alps over there, the Lake Geneva. This is the picture of uh, the collider that is underground. My experiment is somewhere there, far away, and uh, a little dot somewhere there is my house as well. Now, we all know the structure of the atom. You have all studies, your, you have somewhere in school, you have this memory that atoms are made out of nucleus and electrons, protons and quarks. But how do we know this? We know this because we made nice experiments like smashing things together. Before the particle accelerator was there, we would smash things together and then we take pictures and we try to understand what, is, what matter is made of and look under the microscope. Now, once we made the accelerator, with the accelerator, we are able to collide 
particles. Particles like the proton of which, which is inside the atom. And this proton, when it gathers enough energy in the accelerator, very, very high energy, then when these two beams are made to collide at various points, they actually, um, here for example, you get um, collisions and we recreate the Big Bang in a very tiny manner, controlled conditions, underground, no, uh, no danger to anybody, and we try to study them using detectors, right? And using all the information from the cosmic uh, cosmology, which is, for example, at this scale, you have heard about the Hubble's telescope, and all the measurements done from cosmology and astronomy, and the super microscope, that's the LHC, we can span a scale that's also the order of 10 to the power minus 32 centimeters, which is very, 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 very tiny, to the scale of very, 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 very big, that is 10 to the 28 centimeters. And uh, how do we stand there? That's the size where, which you recognize. I'm sure you recognize Monica here, right? And she's about a meter and a half, or maybe a, a little more. So that's the scale where we sit, but we need to go to all these scales of the galaxies and the universe, and on the other side, proton, atom, and so on, up to the Big Bang. So we made this microscope, and we try to study these conditions. So let's imagine these two helicopters are made out of a Lego, right? And we try to collide them. Imagine that we, these two helicopters are the protons inside my accelerator, and I give them enough energy so that they can, col they can collide with very, very, very high energies. Now, once they collide, uh, what will happen? It will break, right? And you'll get pieces of? Pieces of? Lego, right? Let's try to see what happens if we go to very high energies. Hmm? So they collide. Oh, what came out? We got things that we didn't expect, right? But these are, you believe in dinosaurs because you have seen the fossils and you have seen signatures, isn't it? You have seen the signatures of dinosaurs because you have seen the, the fossils. Similarly, there have been particles that existed at the time of the Big Bang, but they are no more there. And we are able to recreate them inside the accelerator. And that gives us an insight into what was the world, the universe, the multiverse at the time of the Big Bang. So this is why the accelerator is needed, because we can use the one equation that everyone knows, E is equal to mc squared. So energy, we give a lot of energy to the protons, and once they collide, they can make anything. Not only dinosaurs, but mosquitoes and horses and cats of the particle kind. All right, so that's our accelerator, and we have recreated a time machine, essentially. And that's what we play, the big game that we play at CERN, is to keep smashing things together and trying to look inside, um, inside matter, essentially. So every day, more than 10,000 scientists work at CERN. CERN is a European laboratory. CERN is a European laboratory, but it has international collaborations and India also, of course, participates in a big way at CERN as well. That's just a picture at the entrance at CERN. Um, just as a history, um, European um, countries came together after the Second World War to stop the exodus of scientists to the United States. So they set up a, a center of excellence called CERN where they were able to retain the scientists from Europe. And uh, this is now one of the giant experiments, the CMS experiment. If you see, there are people working here. Can you see the people working there? And these, this gives you a size of, um, an idea of the scale of how big these detectors are, which are essentially taking pictures 40 million times a second of the collisions. So it's a 14,000 ton 3D camera with each one 75 megapixels. They are taking these pictures, right? So just showing you some uh, photos of the installation of this detector. 
how this detector was taken uh, down in the cavern underground. Each piece weighs about 2,000 tons. So 2,000 ton, imagine, think of a crane, many of you must be engineers here, think of a crane that can actually lower an object that is 2,000 tons. It's very difficult, isn't it? So a crane was constructed in situ, in the hall on the surface, across, straddling across the building, where then we could lower this object just like you would lower a bucket in, the, in a well. So that was the technology, but very, very high-tech kind of uh, an operation. The lowering took about 10 hours to come to 400 meters. And uh, you can see these kind of steel girders, and uh, not girders, sorry, steel cables, which are four of them, each one has 100 strands each. And of course, the world was watching, there was media and so on, and the typical scare actually happened. Suddenly, the power went off. In Geneva, I would say that in three years, the power goes off once. And this happened when we were lowering one of the biggest objects downstairs. And as it were, there was this typical comic book scene where one of the technicians was moving with a ladder, you know, and he was going with his ladder and somehow he managed to flip one of the emergency switches. So it was not really that the power went off, it was a small, very tiny, small incident, and fortunately without any consequences at this moment of time. So you see, we have a lot of fun doing things of a very grand nature to look for things of a very tiny nature as well. You might note that the clearance on both sides of the cavern is something like five centimeters on either side. So this object is coming down and it starts swaying. If, for example, if it were to start swaying, it would become very difficult and very dangerous as well, simply because of the weight that is coming down. So therefore, it had to be lowered very, very slowly. And uh, fortunately, it was done in a successful manner. So then the experiment was completed, and we took data and so on, and you've seen the blip in the film that you saw where the Higgs boson was actually discovered. So all the things that we do, looking for answers to questions regarding the universe, regarding matter, and so on, they really lead us to many, many, many applications. One application, perhaps you might know already, is called WWW. Did you know that it was invented at CERN? Awesome. And it was a young student, 23 years old, who wrote the first code, HTTP, and he went to his boss to say that this is the idea that I would like to try. And his boss wrote on that paper, vague but exciting. This was in 1989, and we are 30 years now after the web was really born, and the first web page and the first server which hosted that web page is kept in the museum now at CERN. And from there, we have come a very long way, and just imagine the IT revolution that has come out just because some physicists, some scientists wanted to share data, right? So we are in interfacing between fundamental science and key technological developments. And there are many, many, many technological applications that come out from accelerating beams that we use for our experiments, for detecting the particles, the detectors, and of course, the large scale computing grid. Now, let me give you an example of some medical applications. These are extremely powerful applications that have come out from our laboratory. And uh, the first one of them being hadron therapy. You have all heard about patients being treated by radiotherapy um, for cancer, right? Now, when you have a patient who is treated by x-rays, the entry dose is actually equivalent to the exit dose in a, a, a traditional radiation treatment. So what happens is that the healthy tissue around the tumor is also damaged. By using accelerators, 
in such a way that one is able to treat only the tumor. That really has increased life expectancy and also the quality of life of cancer patients. And there are thousands of accelerators actually being used all over the world for these kind of ther therapeutic treatments. Similarly, imaging and so on, which are rather self-explanatory, you can imagine that these kind of imaging techniques that we use for our collisions, they can be used for uh, in situ measurement of medical imaging for the brains and for other organs inside the body. And they are very much in use many times. Of course, I already spoke about the web. And now, of course, we have loads and loads of things that are happening because of the World Wide Web. Bioinformatics, bioengineering, education and training. Education and training I always bring in because simply when I studied my mathematics and integral and differential calculus, I had sort of just an idea on how these things can be used in real life. It was long ago, you know, you guys are very young and you all have probably gotten a better education. But I have to tell you, I had to put my head around to understand how am I going to use this equation for which movement, for which, you know, uh, parameter and so on. But today, tools exist which actually immediately show you a demonstration of how an equation can be used in real life. And these resources are now absolutely freely available on the net. So for the younger students among you, there is no excuse to say that, oh, I didn't understand what is a Legendre poly polynomial and so on. Similarly, for weather forecasting, we have a collaboration with UNITAR. There is a project called UNOSAT, where satellite imagery is, uh, is monitored. And weather forecasting, which is a very difficult uh, domain, particularly for uh, India, especially because the data is not so much, landslides and so on. So the weather grid system is also one offshoot of the Uni, UNOSAT project. So all these experiments, they keep going at CERN, and we have now sort of evolved into having a project management system also at CERN. You can imagine these crazy scientists, you know, they are, the, they are busy working. They don't care about the project management aspect of this. I remember very, very uh, clearly that when, you know, the first 10, 12 years of my life, I was working only on R&D. And the next 10 years, I worked on production of a certain kind of detector for one of the experiments. So I, I built something like 500 detectors, not I, but the team, you know, there's always a big team behind. It's never alone in these kind of big endeavors. So, um, so in these, uh, when I started moving from the R&D into building a production line, it was kind of a change of uh, paradigm for me. And my, let's say, seniors and my, uh, my mentors, they would always tell me, oh, these managers, they will put you in a box. They are going to uh, make boxes for detectors and already install them even before uh, you, know, you have finalized the design and so on. So it was quite a challenge to grapple with how these things really uh, take shape and how project management has to be used because in the end of the day, we are using resources. We are using manpower. So eventually, time, money, and manpower must be used in a proper and most optimal manner. And that's why uh, I switched somewhere uh, after 20 years into being a project manager. All right. So yes, let's take a look. Those are the kind of collaborations we are talking about. And these are only a few of the people with whom we work. Only in CMS, and this is CMS, my experiment, and we are 5,400 people. And of course, project management from the top is going to be extremely, extremely difficult. So we divide the whole experiment into various kind of coordination areas. And then one part of the area is what I look after. So uh, yes, it's been a long learning process on how to manage people from different cultures and people from different uh, backgrounds, even the different level of, uh, how can I say, preparations. So it's very, very important. Simply, we have been successful. There are six Nobel Prizes coming from CERN. 
And just as an aside, I can say that Switzerland, although it's known for its Bollywood locations and fancy beautiful Alps, but it also is on the top of the innovation index. It's on the top for Nobel Prizes per capita population, right? Why? Simply because there is a lot of emphasis that is put on uh, the way people work and the way education is imparted. I mean, we have also come a long way in India, and I still feel that there is definitely a lot of work that can still be done. So inside the project, obviously, here, incidentally, you see Professor Peter Higgs at my experiment. He is the one who got this Nobel Prize on behalf of the work of the 5,400 people only in my experiment. And there are two experiments because you have to compare and corroborate. One experiment cannot say, I have found the Higgs. And then the other, then somebody can say that you guys are just fibbing. You have not really found it. So you need a second experiment to say, we also found it using other kind of techniques. So yes. Uh, this was a very big uh, achievement, and there are clear definitions, clear agreement on roles, and of course, thank you, the group goals are, are placed above personal satisfaction and or recognition. This is something very important that we have to learn simply how to collaborate. I really learned this when I have been working in this large collaboration. You have to work in a very transparent and collaborative manner, and that's when science and technology can really go further. Complete open communication within the teams, absolute willingness to forgive. If you don't fail, you don't make progress. We heard that theme several times already in this uh, conference. So failing is very important. And if you haven't failed, it means that you, do, you haven't really made any progress. And of course, there's a, also very important to, um, to have recognition. In this 5,400 uh, group of people, you have to recognize people also, individually as well. So how we will divide into different groups and how the, the, the recognition is given is very important and encouragement is given. Succession planning is given as well. Because let me tell you that the average age of this uh, huge collaboration is around 30, which means many people are between 25 and 35. So those are the most contributing doctoral students and postdoctoral students who really work 24 seven. And of course, the managers also work 24 seven, I should not take away the credit from the managers, but then the teams are really working towards building their budding careers as well. So that's where I come in. People ask frequently how to start because indeed we are so disoriented. Physics is such a fuzzy subject. It's not IT, it's not programming, it's not electronics, it's not this. How, how do we go about it? You know, I would say people do speak about passion. Passion is somewhat overrated. Let me tell you just a little uh, um, aside that I went to CERN when I had nearly completed my PhD, all right, in the Delhi University. Delhi University is a very big university of the country, and I thought, oh, wow, I have done my PhD. And I was a, quite a good student in school. You know, I had a lot of medals and stellar CV and so on. But when I arrived at CERN, I looked around and I saw, oh, my God, I don't know anything. I fell flat. I really had to work doubly hard, and I had literally to take on a second PhD. That's my DSC, if you have noticed simply because I had to come to par with my German and Italian and French and UK and US counterparts. Because the way they, are for, they've, they were familiar with the technologies and the ease with which they were able to use the technologies was certainly not my case. So it was very important at that moment of time for me to, to work like a donkey, like was uh, prescribed in the morning session. And I did work like a donkey for flat 12 years without a weekend, without anything. And of course, looking after my family as well, which uh, Dr. Lalit Ambika mentioned, because it's very important for a woman not to give up the priority of the family as well. So all those things together, they, they brought me to the point where CERN being a European uh, institution which did not engage other nationals than Europe, than member states, I was given an exceptional staff position at CERN. And this was a 
for me and for the country, it was a very big step, I would say. I'm sorry to be immodest, but indeed, this is just to tell you that working like a donkey is a good idea. All right. So then I moved, uh, let me say, so those were the first 12 years. Second 10 years, I was busy with the installation and coordination team of CMS of this huge detector where I was involved in the installation and commissioning and eventually operations of this detector. So a great amount of learning experience and it really gave me a lot of inspiration to go further. So in 2009, I proposed a new technology for the CMS experiment. So there must be a few people whom you can count on your fingers who have proposed new technology that can be inserted into an experiment. And you can believe the road had just begun. The fight had just begun at that moment. Simply because you come up with a new technology and you say, I want to use this in the experiment, there will be 25 people telling you, no, this cannot be done. Because how, come, how do you prove that this is going to be a sustained technology which will stay there for 20 years in CMS? So then go back, R&D, this, that, write uh, reports, make a team, get all the work done. 2015, the project was approved, right? And this project has several stations and it's exactly in, I will not go through all these details. I mean, these, these are just examples of people whom I have been working with and who have been working with me together we've made the team and even in the country we have made four laboratories where we are making our detectors so these detectors were then made in different parts of the world and they were shipped to CERN and at CERN right now right now while we are speaking here my colleagues are installing these detectors into CMS because right now we are in a shutdown at LHC. We are stopped at LHC so that we can upgrade CMS. And they are uh, installing the detectors and CERN is tweeting CMS gems set to glitter. All right. CM CERN is tweeting about the project and Fermilab, which is a, a sister uh, organization in the United States, they have put it on their top web page that CMS has an upgrade with GEMS, which is the technology that I have brought into CMS. So just to say that we, we cannot just give up, and these are some of the pictures. You can see my sad face, you know, when I did not understand anything, and you can see my happy face where I sort of start understanding something. All right, so I think uh, here I will not go in any detail, just to say that those detectors actually work and we have seen some signs. Now I'm choking projects for 2026 and the teams are there. Of course, I'm getting old, so young kids have to take over and I am preparing my new team for the future projects and that's absolutely fantastic because what is the strength of my project are the students. I can tell you that more than 500 students have gone through my laboratory in the last two decades. Okay? Many, many of them from India. You see, these are all students from India. India, 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 India. Many of them from India, all from India, in fact. And one way or the other, they have contributed, they have learned something, they have picked up the culture, and they have they are all doing extremely well and I am very proud of this network of students that I have and my dream would be to have a dream project where all the students can come back and we can all work together again. But then those are dreams. Of course, project management is very important. These things are probably more familiar to you and a very poorly done organigram probably because you know we are scientists, we just need to get the work done. So sorry about the aesthetics of this organigram but you see that a young young uh, team is getting ready and I'm going to be ejected out from here very soon, willingly ejected because I want to go to other things. Just showing that we do look at project management and we continuously move into uh, consolidation of who is doing what and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Okay, so just one last thing is that these large collaborations in science, in project management that I have uh, spoken about, are really very, very important. And 60 to 70% of students and postdocs who work at CERN for their uh, PhDs or for their postdoctoral, they all end up in the industry. 
So that's where you see the intersection of what particle physics gives to the world. Since we deal with very huge amount of data, 65 to 70 petabytes of data per year, per experiment, we give to the world a lot of financial managers, risk managers, engineers, space scientists, astrophysicists, and so on. I mean, you can just dream about what we can do and how we can really take the learnings that we learn in particle physics. So let me just conclude by saying that it's very important for us to, uh, to keep focused, remain in the circle of concern, not to disparage our colleagues. Being women, it's very important that, you know, we, we I think, uh, as women have a certain edge because we uh, need to work like a family in the, in, the, in the laboratory as well, in the teams as well, and, of course, in the arena, in the professional arena, there is no distinction. This is very important. Dr. Lalita Amika also mentioned that, that there is no distinction between a woman and a man in the professional arena. We have to be ready to fail. I have, I have to tell you, I have failed so many times. The, the story I told you about the last project, I hope someday I'll have time to write it down because the number of times I failed and eventually got up and got started again is uh, is, is, a, is several, but then I think that for the next, for the future, let's keep going and use all the lessons that we have learned for our new, next, larger, bigger projects, also serving our country in, the, in using all what we have learned. When we go abroad, we learn things and we should bring them back to the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam. May I call upon Mr. Ramam Atmakuri, former founding member of PMI Pearl City chapter, former president, reg former region of mentor, chapter mag, what not, the guiding force. Two, honor and felicity, Dr. Thank Shari. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.